Chapter 4 The Violins Richard was still reluctant while approaching the concert stage at Carnegie Hall, but when he saw his two best friends, Mark and Circe Coppola, standing under the lights, it gave him hope. Eight months had passed since he had last visited with them, and it was only then that he realized that a tired, lonesome feeling had imperceptibly settled into his bones. Even though his tour had been professionally satisfying, he was emotionally drained. Yet, as he continued in their direction, he quickly traded the hollow, empty feeling for a smile. Other than Samuel and the Coppolas, there was no one else that Richard could call a friend. All of the others, including Carl Reber, had simply been business associates or acquaintances. Richard considered Mark and Circe extraordinary musicians as well as great people. They both played first chair in the Philharmonic, Mark on his violin and Circe on her viola. And no matter where their conversations took them, they always lifted his spirits. Richard had first met Mark and Circe while touring a vineyard in Italy. Mark and Circe were on their honeymoon while Richard was taking a much-needed vacation. The three of them were the only visitors in the wine cellar that afternoon, and Richard had been ardently discussing the vintages with their tour guide when the power went off. They were asked to remain calm and stay where they were until a flashlight could be retrieved. Mark, Circe, and Richard began talking in the dark, first about fine wines, then about music and their lives. By the time their escort returned, they were the best of friends, laughing and joking together. They even insisted that the tour guide go away and quit bothering them after he offered to show them the way out. They had taken many trips together over the years, and Richard had always made it a point to visit with them whenever he flew to Europe. Later, when Mark and Cersei moved to the United States, Richard had loaned them his apartment so they could get settled into their new positions without the usual hassle of finding a place to live. Circe noticed Richard first and tapped Mark on the shoulder before sauntering across the stage in his direction. Her slim figure and cool flowing style were entrancing, and Richard wondered if she was exaggerating her movements so he would notice that her black flowing hair had finally grown past her waist. Circe fondly embraced Richard with her aromatic tresses swirling around his back, and he was immediately surrounded by a sweet potpourri of scents. His emotions began swimming. He had almost forgotten what it was like to hold a woman, and his senses became even further tantalized as her face came up next to his. Richard had always admired Circe and all of the feelings that emanated from her, it was as if she were the essence of old Italy. Fragrances of fine wines, oil paintings, rare spices, and so much more. It amazed Richard how each intoxicating fragrance could be so savory and unique, yet they never mixed together or detracted from one another. An embrace from Circe was a wonderful experience, and not making arrangements to visit with them the last time he was in New York was indefensible. Circe stepped back. There was always mystery lingering around her, and after exchanging polite kisses, Richard contemplated. Mark is a lucky man. Even though Mark and Circe were both accomplished musicians on their respective instruments, when they performed together, it was unbelievable impeccable, beyond reproach, and deeply passionate. The critics had said the words, and Richard agreed. Richard gave Mark a genuine hug, while Circe affectionately put her arms around both of them. I understand that we're finally going to help you do some serious shopping, Richard. Richard was still hesitant about trying the new violins, Yet he replied by smiling and nodding. It's about time, Circe exclaimed. She never was right for you, Richard. Circe's long, slender fingers eased her way around the handle of Richard's violin case and lifted it away. Normally, his reaction would have been to hold on tight, 
but Circe was far too dear a friend, and he curiously watched as she placed it on a large oak table covered with padded silk in the middle of the stage. Circe began unfastening the latches. She is much too serious for you, Richard. You need to loosen up and have some fun. Circe raised her hand to her chin as if pondering what she was going to say next. And there's something else about her. Who? asked Richard, now wondering if Circe had changed the subject and was now referring to a woman. You're Bergonzi, of course, Circe replied. Circe appeared genuinely surprised at Richard's lack of understanding and opened the case. You've had her all of these years, and you act as though you don't even know her. Richard shook his head while Circe continued. You're like the little Jewish boy whose match was made for him when he was 14. He marries the girl, lives with her, eats with her, sleeps with her, then has children with her. Circe lifted the instrument out of the case in full view. He then rolls over in bed one morning, throws down the covers and screams, Who are you? Circe's eyes were opened wide and staring directly at Richard's Bergonzi. Richard wasn't sure how to take Circe's comments, and he turned toward Mark. Tears formed in Mark's eyes as he unsuccessfully struggled to suppress a laugh. Richard did not enjoy being the brunt of jokes, especially from his best friends. Even though Mark had based his entire life on exotic flavors, adrenaline rushes, and good humor, he knew how sensitive Richard could be about his personal life, and he apologized for both of them. We're sorry, Richard. Everyone looks at music differently. Circe and I just get more emotionally involved when it comes to the instruments we play. She didn't mean any offense. Mark glanced at Circe with reprimand for her joke. Circe returned with a look of innocence that could have melted a heart of stone. After resisting for as long as he could, Mark's features softened and his expression quickly became amorous. Richard stared while Mark and Circe looked at each other with wanton desire. Judging by their expressions, he thought that they were going to fall into each other's arms and start rolling around on the hardwood floor. Their flippant display of emotion repulsed him at first, but then he was jealous. After composing themselves, Circe offered, We're only here to help you, Richard. We can give you our advice and opinions, but you're the one who must choose the instrument that's right for you. As if they had been waiting for their cue, two violin dealers stepped forward from the far edge of the stage. After carefully lowering their valuable merchandise onto the table, they greeted Richard and his friends with large smiles and friendly handshakes. These are the instruments that you requested, Mr. Gaspar offered Mr. Singer, the first violin dealer. Realize that we also have many fine old Italians to choose from. Richard understood Mr. Singer's hesitancy. Any player of Richard's caliber would usually have been offended at the prospect of trying out new violins, as indeed Richard still was. And this is the fine Joseph Guinarius you played upon while visiting our shop announced the second dealer while politely bowing. He immediately opened the case so Richard could admire his violin first. We have made a sound post adjustment and fitted it with the same brand of E-string that is on your Bergonzi. We hope that it will now answer to all of your needs. As soon as the dealer stepped back, Richard instinctively reached for the Guinarius. He picked it up with reverence. Four million dollars, he whispered while rotating it in his hands. He retrieved his violin bow, applied a small amount of rosin, then tuned the instrument's strings while walking toward the front of the stage. Hear how it rings, he exclaimed. Without waiting for a response, Richard's bow came down and music instantly burst forth from the 250-year-old master violin.
His fingers flew, testing its full range of tone in all the positions. Richard played the most difficult arpeggios across all four strings, with his fingers flying effortlessly and free. When he softened the pressure, each note became pure and sweet. He pushed harder, and the tone was full and powerful again, reaching easily to the back of the hall. Without pausing between pieces, Richard finished with a flamboyant cadenza, his bow flying off the strings into the air. Richard turned toward the second dealer and exclaimed, You have done it! The dealer responded with a nod and a large smile. After allowing a moment for Richard's exuberance to subside, Mr. Singer politely gestured toward his two unopened violin cases. Richard shook his head while carrying the Guinarius over to where Mark and Circe were standing so they could admire it more closely under the lights. He rocked it back and forth, showing them how deeply flamed the maple was. Richard's eyes glimmered, and so much of the original varnish left. Look how the colors change in the light. No new instrument could ever look like this. What do you think? Do I really need to look any further? It's wonderful, they both replied. I knew it. I knew this violin was mine the first time I saw it. Richard turned toward the second dealer and declared, It's settled then. I'll take it. The dealer nodded while mirroring Richard's look of satisfaction. What about the others? Circe inquired, hesitant to interrupt Richard's euphoria. What about them? Richard replied. Nothing could ever compare to this. After replacing the Guinarius in its case, Richard grabbed the dealer's arm and moved toward the edge of the stage, discussing money down, insurance costs, and interest. Circe smiled when she saw how happy Richard was, then turned toward Mr. Singer. Do you mind if I try one of your violins while Richard takes care of business? Mr. Singer's countenance brightened, and he executed a polite bow. Certainly, madam, though you may prefer this one. His fingertips came to rest on a light blue case. And perhaps the gentleman may wish to play a few notes upon the other? Mr. Singer motioned Mark toward a dark leather violin case covered with forged steel rivets. Mark responded with a curious smile. Yes, please. Circe had unfastened the latches on the light blue case by the time Mark reached the other side of the table. She lifted the lid and let out a gasp. It was loud enough that Richard turned to see what had happened. When he failed to notice anything wrong, he continued talking with the second dealer, who by then had papers spread out on a folding table and was punching numbers into his calculator. Mark looked at Circe, wondering if she had somehow hurt herself on the latches. She stood motionless, staring down in shock and horror. Then gradually, her face became consumed with sorrow. Mark felt a twinge of deja vu. Circe's expression was identical to that of one ten years earlier in Italy, while he watched her grieve over his seven-year-old niece, Tiana, at her funeral. The pointless tragedy and deep emotions had burned the images of that day into both of their minds forever. He cautiously took a step towards Circe, so he could also look down into the case. There lay a light brown violin, elegantly nestled in a satiny sky-blue fabric. The fine patterns of tucks and folds were exactly like Tiana's small coffin. Mark couldn't help feeling the sorrow he had experienced while staring down at Tiana. Her delicate face was so pitiful, and her pure white dress had made her look like a silenced angel. Mark choked and closed his eyes in pain. He was the one who had found her lifeless body and pulled it from the canal. He had loved Tiana so much, 
Everyone did. She had always worn a smile and two small butterflies pinned in her light brown hair. When Mark reopened his eyes, he noticed that Circe's gaze had moved up. In the lid of the violin case was a delicately carved bow with mother-of-pearl butterflies inlaid in its frog. Circe wept, and Mark watched the tears drop from her cheeks like the evening rain upon the shimmering silk lining of the case. Circe couldn't find the strength to lift her arms and wipe her eyes. Instead, she pitifully looked toward Mr. Singer for an answer. He responded with compassion, then offered her a handkerchief and a gentle, reassuring nod. After Circe wiped away the tears, Mr. Singer motioned for her to play the violin. She hesitated, but was gently persuaded by Mr. Singer's smile, which seemed to say, Trust me, it will be all right. Circe lifted the instrument with trembling hands, and as she did, the color instantly changed when the stage lights shone directly upon the varnish. It was as if the bright lights were bringing the violin to life. The violin glowed in Circe's embrace, and all of her fears turned to hope. She now held the violin as though it were the most precious gift on earth. She smiled at its elegant form and softly touched one of its cheeks with her finger. Circe carefully placed the violin on the padded silk, so it would remain in the light, and reached for the butterfly bow. After tightening the hair, she lifted the violin and began playing. Richard was still at the other side of the stage talking with the second dealer, but he stopped mid-sentence when the softly dancing, elegant notes came floating over to him. A tingling sensation ran up Richard's spine that left his head swimming, as if he were in a dream. He quickly turned, yet every move he made felt like it was being performed in slow motion. The crisp, spiccato notes that Circe played on the G string rang like church bells, while those on the E string sounded like the tinkling of small wind chimes in the breeze. When Circe caressed the instrument with smooth, flowing passages, they were so indescribably sweet that Richard could taste them in his mouth. Richard had never heard critics utter any words that could have possibly described the sound he was listening to. The music danced and floated effortlessly and free across the stage. It sang out over the empty chairs and laughed up to the ceiling. The violin cried to itself and to everyone there when Circe played slowly. Then it laughed again with a charm that no one could resist, and every sound was in the purest, sweetest voice of a child. They stood spellbound everyone gazing towards Circe as though looking through a morning mist in springtime. The notes were happy and carefree, never seeming to ever die away. They just floated out forever, then lingered in the air, filling it with a sweetness. No one moved for fear of disturbing the feeling, and they remained perfectly still until after Circe had finished playing. They even wondered if they could have moved while she played, the sounds were so entrancing. The voice of the violin never did die away. Everyone just noticed that it was no longer in the air after a few minutes. Mark, who hadn't moved a muscle, now reached for the center latch of the other violin case. He was anxious, yet apprehensive of what might be waiting for him. The two Outer hand-forged latches had spring-loaded bars, forcing Mark to use both hands, and the large, stiff hinges creaked when they rotated. It sent a shiver down Mark's spine, and the feeling on stage became ominous. Inside lay a black violin, large, rough, and bulky.
The case looked a thousand years old and had been lined with thick, heavy leather, resembling a gladiator's uniform. The instrument had a presence of massive strength, and when Mark grabbed it by the neck and lifted it out, the scroll was roughly hewn with large eyes sunk deep amongst the fluting. He pulled the bow off the steel rack in the lid and tightened it with resolve. The wood was thick, and Mark instinctively knew how the violin was meant to be played. He walked to center stage, drew the bow high in the air, and immediately pounded it across the backs of the strings. A deep, gruff voice bellowed out through the concert hall and crashed against the back wall. It returned with so much force that everyone felt like they had been slapped in the face with its echo. When Mark raised the bow a second time, the hair on the back of everyone's neck pricked up in fear and intimidation. Boom! The sound roared out with the same effect. Boom! Mark bore down hard on the strings and filled the large concert hall to capacity with its deep, powerful voice. He played bold passages that surged and echoed through the hall, like thunder tearing through the skies. The roaring burst out the doors and bolted down the halls into the foyer. The massive sound took Richard completely by surprise, and he turned in Mark's direction. He watched in amazement as Mark's demeanor changed to that of a depraved taskmaster, digging ruthlessly into the instrument, pounding and grinding with all of his might. With Mark's added effort, the tone of the instrument transformed. The beating of drums and the blasts of trumpets echoed back from the concert hall, sounding so real to Richard that he could actually feel the ancient Roman sun beating down on him in the Colosseum. It was no longer music echoing back from the seats, but the savage screams of spectators waiting for blood. It was the strangest feeling that Richard had ever experienced. The seats in the concert hall were all empty, yet something was there, and he looked up when he heard the roar of a lion from the balcony. He could smell the stench of sweat and death in the air, and next heard the scraping of claws against a creaking gate. Richard's gaze swung back toward Mark, and he could swear that the seats were now full and overflowing with pandemonium. Mark played furiously on, and the outlines of the spectators became more vivid and real with every stroke of his bow. He was in his own world, oblivious to everything around him. As the images became clear, two enormous lions burst forth from the back of the hall and ran down the aisles amidst a frenzy of deafening screams. The chanting of the spectators swelled with the speed of the animal's claws upon the ground until it reached the fevered pitch of a riot. Richard's eyes opened wide while enormous white fangs and two pairs of yellow eyes rushed forward between the bloodthirsty masses. The animals leapt on stage, roared with all of their might, then turned towards Richard and crouched down. Their heads lowered, their muscles tightened, and as they sprang through the air with outstretched claws, Richard instinctively threw his arms over his head and screamed. The concert hall instantly fell silent when Mr. Singer grabbed the end of Mark's violin bow. Mark was drenched with sweat, and his body shook in convulsions, and when he finally relaxed his iron-fisted grip on the bow, Mr. Singer quietly stepped back. Mark almost dropped the violin while replacing it in the case. He was completely drained of energy, and every movement he made became a struggle. He loosened the bow and rehung it in the heavy steel rack, and when the lid dropped, it came down with a clank that echoed mournfully across the stage like a dark dungeon door. After rechecking the latches one more time, just to make sure, Mark shuddered, straightened himself up, and turned toward the others with a large grin. 
Richard didn't smile back. His eyes remained fixed on the two large sets of deep scratches in the hardwood floor.